It is a pleasure for us to be here. It's the first time in, our, in this church, and you have a very beautiful church, absolutely beautiful. And when I say that, I mean the people first, because the people are the church. This is just a housing of the church. We make the church. So wherever we go, the church is there. That is why I keep inviting people. I know that now after the pandemic, it's so easy to be at home and watch whatever preacher you like because you maybe just don't like your preacher. Oh, I know one that preaches better than him. But whenever you, go, you stay at home and you watch online, you're missing the energy of worship. You're missing on meeting with God because you meet with God as you meet with other people. Our meeting with one another becomes the meeting with God. So that's why I insist and I encourage you to come here and participate in this worship together. Yes, as Pastor Joseph mentioned, we've known each other for more than 20 years. We went to the same uh, uh, college back in Romania. We worked in the conferences together. He was in a different conference than I was, but the, our respective departments, the education departments worked together. And we've, we've shared our intellectual journey a lot in these years that have passed. And he is right. I've been interested in this topic. I was actually trying to ascertain when was the date that I, that I got really hooked by this. And it was probably 27 years ago. Um, I first encountered Henry M. Morris's book, Scientific Creationism, when I was a teenager. I was 13 or 14 at that time. And I got hooked by this topic. I was amazed at the world we live in. Now, as I grew, you know, in my understanding, I don't necessarily agree with everything Henry and Morris said, and I don't even wholeheartedly recommend that book. It's outdated, and it has some philosophical issues that we will discuss. But let's stay with this. <clears throat> the world we live in is absolutely amazing. Because I don't know if you've ever been at night outside and just watch the skies. Maybe you're not a geek like I am, but I used to do that a lot when I was in high school. Uh, I just had a, I didn't have a telescope at that, at that time. I just had a map of the stars. And I would just go out and look at those wonderful things. The heavens, the Bible says that the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his, hand, of his hands. And with the technology that we have today, we can see even more of his marvelous works. When I was a teenager and I was watching the skies, I could name the constellations, and they were just beautiful for me. Uh, and you look, if you look well, uh, long enough at the stars, you start to see that they have different brightness, different colors, different frequency. You start to get to know them. And, you know, just as a very interesting uh, fact, you know the constellation Orion, yeah? Do you know the constellation Orion? Everybody's heard of Orion, yeah? One of the stars, I think the one in the upper left corner, Betelgeuse, it's called, it's about to go supernova. Scientists say it's going to blow up pretty soon. We don't know how soon, but they know that because, and I remember when I was a teenager, I didn't remember to having seen it that red. Now it's very, very red. It's like a red giant, so it's going to blow up pretty soon. We don't know exactly when. I would really love to see a supernova in my lifetime. So watch out for Orion. The upper left star might blow up pretty soon. You look at the macrocosm, you look at the universe, and you marvel how beautiful this world is. But it's not just that. Because if you look, so we look outside, but if you look inside, you also see that the microcosmos is also mind-boggling, amazing. You see, when people started st studying what happens inside of us, because of the technological limitations, they didn't really understand. So when Darwin wrote his book, uh, The Origin of Species, the scientific knowledge of the cell at that time, they thought the cell was like a, just a broad blob of protoplasm with some chemicals inside and some membrane. That's all they knew about it because the technology didn't allow them. But when we look right now in the cell, we discover a city in the right meaning of the word. 
So what you see now on the screen is a what is called, um, it's, it's, it's not a photo. You might be seeing posts that it's a photo. It's not a photo. It's a representation. So it's a drawing. But the artists who did it, who are, um, what's their name? Ivan Ingersoll and Gail McGill, they try to depict as much as detail as possible what happens in the cell. And this is just a part of it. It's not everything. We'll go into details in another presentation while I'll tell you about more of the things that happen here in this very picture. But just take a look at it. The more we discover about the cell, and we've got hundreds of trillions of those inside of us, hundreds of trillions of cells, each one of them is more complex than anything we have ever built. The most complex thing that humanity has built is probably this uh, International Space Station. And that is order of magnitude, orders of magnitude less complex than this. This is a city. It has everything a city has. It has power plants, it has transportation systems, it has, it has sewage, it has sanitation trucks, it has gates, it has everything, highways. It's basically a city. And you have hundreds of trillions of those inside of you, every one of us. Isn't that mind-boggling? So you look outside at the universe with hundreds of trillions of galaxies, each one with hundreds of trillions of stars, and you become amazed. You look inside with hundreds of trillions of, of cells, each one a city, and you become amazed. Even Psalmist David said, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and I know this very well. And he didn't have a microscope. We have microscopes now. So we have even more reasons to become amazed by the power of creation, by the power of God. So the reality is we live in a very complex and beautiful world. And of course, because we humans are curious, the next question that is going to pop in our mind and that has been popping in the mind of humanity since its inception is what? How did we come to be? That's the question. How did we, how do we do that? How does this world, how does it exist? Why? Did, did someone make it or did it just appear? Well, there's only two broad possibilities. That's it. You don't have more than just two. Just two, big. There's more inside of them and we'll talk about it. But there's just two broad possibilities. Either everything that exists appeared and developed by itself from nothing, or there was a creator that exists through himself since eternity, and he created everything. There are no other possibilities. Now, these two possibilities are not singular, okay? These are, these are just the ends of a spectrum. Depending on how much the two get combined, you get many other possibilities between them. And I want to talk about them a little bit. Actually, I want to stop a bit and just want to tell you that this presentation today has three parts. So this first part, we're going to go, we're going to survey what are the main theories about origins in the church and outside of the church. And I would like each one of you to see if you can identify with one or two of these options that I'm going to present right away. So this is the first part. The second part, I want to talk about some of the challenges that we face as a church, as people of faith with science, and why it is important to talk about these things. The third part is how we can talk about this. We're going to discuss about some things of how to relate to this, very, uh, uh, this topic that is very intimidating. I mean, science is not easy. You look at uh, biomolecular uh, 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 molecular biology, you look at quantum physics, science is hard. And the topics of origin is even harder because it's a multidisciplinary topic. You need to know many sciences to deal with this thing. So I want to just give a little bit from the Bible some advice on how to deal with this. And we're going to go to a young man who lived 2,600 years ago. And we're going to see if we can learn something from his, his experience. But until then, let's look at this spectrum of theories of origins. And I want to ask you to, I, to see if you can identify with, with what I'm presenting here. So there's basically, <clears throat> there's several subcategories. These are just a few of them. 
Uh, I can't mention all of them because, of course, we're going to spend all week talking about that. But starting with one end of the spectrum, when God creates everything directly, you have what is called young earth creationism. So basically, young earth creationism says that God created everything, the whole universe, fairly recently, 6,000 years ago. Those are really, really staunch creationists. They say 6,000 years ago. Some say maybe 10,000 years ago. In a literal seven-day week, but everything, all the universe, all the stars, everything. Okay, So that's one end of the spectrum. God created that directly 6,000 years ago. Okay? Then you have what is this called <clears throat> old earth creationism. They still have God creating things directly, but he still uses evolution. So what does he do? <clears throat> the universe was created 15 billion years ago by God. Uh, then he created the whole system, created the earth, and then he created the first cell, okay, the first form of life. He allowed this form of life to evolve, you know, to, to develop, to become more complex through evolution until it got to one point where it could not evolve more. Then God intervened and took it over the threshold. Okay, so again, direct intervention of God. Then he again allowed it to evol evolve for millions of years until the process is repeated and we get to humans. And he created humans directly. Okay, so that's old earth creationism, progressive creationism. There are different terms for everything. <clears throat> Now let's go to the, to the other next point on our spectrum. When God doesn't intervene directly that much. This is theistic evolution or evolutionary creation. The um, theologian and scientist that I'm studying for my dissertation is a very, very, uh, how should I put it? A very honest believer, an evangelical who believes in Jesus Christ and loves Jesus Christ, who's, who created, who coined the, ther the term evolutionary creation. So he believes in evolu evolutionary creation, but he's a Christian, and he's a devout Christian who believes in Jesus Christ. So we have to be very careful with that. I'm going to talk about, about it a little bit. His name is Denny Lamoureux, a Canadian um, uh, who's, who's a scientist and a theologian. Okay, so what is theistic evolution or evolutionary creation? <clears throat> God is still the creator. He created this world because he cares about it, but he didn't create it directly. He created the laws of nature, and then gave matter and energy the first input, and then allowed it to develop, to flourish, to grow, to evolve according to these laws. Okay, so the universe expanded, then the solar systems were created, and then life appeared on earth by the process of abiogenesis. God did not intervene directly. He just pre-programmed matter to do that. And then life appeared, and it started to evolve until we got humans. But still, God did not get involved directly. So he just created laws of nature. And then he stood and watched over his creation. And that is theistic evolution or evolutionary creation. The next step is deistic evolution, <clears throat> there's not a lot of people who believe that anymore. Maybe some very um, ends, uh, on the end of the spectrum of liberal theologians, but most liberal theologians today would be theistic evolutionists or evolutionary creationists. They're not deistic evolutionists. This is just maybe the 18th, 19th century when people still believe that God created everything, but he just didn't care. Created everything and then he left. And he just, creation developed on its own, he was distant from the world. He doesn't care about the world anymore. That's the eastic evolution. You'll find that in some, in some literature. And then, of course, we get to the athe atheistic evolution, or the way Daniel Amaro puts it, and I like this word, distillological evolution. Okay, this is a crazy word. We don't use that in, in common language. But whenever you see the word telos, teleological, you see, that comes from the word Greek, which means purpose. Okay? So whenever you see that word, it means either with purpose, teleological, or without a purpose, this teleological evolution. So that's how we unpack this crazy word that we're never going to use, but maybe you find it in the literature. So that means, of course, <clears throat> that the world, the universe, just appeared by itself through the Big Bang. It just developed. There's no creator. 
Nobody to watch over it. The laws of nature just appeared on their own. Because of those laws of nature, life appeared at one point on a planet, happened to be ours, and then it developed, and here we are. So this is what mainly people believe about creation. Um, what do you think? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but just look at it, this list. Can you identify yourself in a position somewhere there? Uh, I'm not in any of those. I'm going to tell you at the end where I am. That's going to be the model of, the, of, my, uh, dissertation, uh, of my dissertation. It's a new model of creation. It's not necessarily new, but it has some very interesting points that I'm going to show to you next week. We're going to build into that, okay? Can you see yourselves here? Okay? Just remember this list. We're going to talk about it again at the end of this presentation. So how are we going to figure out which one is the correct answer? How, how, are, we, how are we going to know where, what to choose, what to believe about creation? Well, you know, the first answer that comes into people's mind when you ask them how do you determine something is what? Science, of course. That's how we figure out things today. We just had a, pan a pandemic. We still have it. Science found the answer, okay? Vaccines and all the, uh, those, uh, what, how, what do you call them? Distancing rules and, and stuff like that, masks. And, okay, science found an answer. All the problems that we in the modern world have, they're solved with science. Okay, science found new m means of transportation, planes. That's why it took us only five and a half hours to fl fly from Miami to uh, Los Angeles and not two days driving by car. Because some scientists, a hundred something years ago, discovered the effects of the law of aerodynamics. Okay, and they figured it out that <clears throat> there's a difference in pressure if the surface is curved, so something heavier than air can lift up in the air. And then some other engineers said, huh, we could build something. And that's how we have airplanes. Uh, what? Antibiotics and energy that we have to do. Now they're trying to make fusion reactors. Scientists invented fission reactors, which are nice and good and clean, where they don't blow up, like in Chernobyl. But other than that, they're clean. You still have to take care of the garbage, which is the nuclear waste, but it's still clean. <clears throat> Now they're trying to build a fusion reactor when they will fuse two atoms of hydrogen, make helium, and a lot of energy. It's still very complicated. They still put into it more energy than they get out, so it's still not feasible. But they're going to do it. 30 years, maybe? Who knows? That's how suns work, okay? Fusion. So science is where we look for answers, okay? Science is where we find the answers. But what does science say about creation? Of course, science always advances the last option. Atheistic evolution. This theological evolution. You see, that, that's the answer that science today offers. But, you see, we as a church, not necessarily our church, but all the churches, they have a different answer. The church says that somehow God created the world. And I showed you all those different methods, yeah, with more or less evolution. But there still is there's a difference between what science says and what theology says. Some people call it a conflict. Some people call it a war. And some people ask us, why do you accept the findings of science in medicine, physics, chemistry, astronomy, everything. But you don't accept the findings of the science of evolution. Isn't that a bit of cognitive dissonance? I mean, you just pick and choose which sciences you like and which sciences you don't like. You accept the science of medicine, you accept the science of biology, you accept the science of physics, but you don't accept the science of evolution. Why? We have to be consistent. That's a very serious question. Now, uh, remember this question. We're going to get back to it later. Just remember the tension now, because that's a real tension. 
And I'm going to explain it a little bit, but before that, let's just look at some of the percentages of people who, uh, you know, I don't think you can see it that much, who um, believe there's a conflict between science and religion. There's basically 55% of adults in the United States that believe there's a conflict between science and religion. And then young adults from a Christian background <clears throat> who believe that churches are out of step with the scientific world we live in, that's 29%. So 29% of the youth in our church, roughly, okay, believe the church they live in is out of touch with the world of science that they live in. And young adults from a Christian background who believe Christianity is anti-science, that's 25%. Do you expect those children to stay in the church? You see, some people don't, just don't care about this. Some people don't care about science, don't care about evolution. Some people say, well, I believe uh, God created everything 6,000 years ago, and that's enough for me. Some other people say, well, I believe God just used evolution to create the world, and that's it. I'm not going to bother further. But we have people in the, in, the, in the church who care, and who care a lot about this, as we'll see. Then you have college freshmen who view their relation between science and faith as one of conflict. That's 31%. So you see, almost a third of people, of young people, they don't identify with the message that the church has regarding creation. What do you think is going to happen with them? And the problem is even more complicated for us as a church, for the Adventist church, because we believe so much in science. We have hospitals. Actually, we have, some of the, we have the largest Protestant chains of hospitals in the United States because that's how much we believe in, in, in the science of medicine. But... In the same time, we don't accept the science of evolution. And some people say that medicine is based on evolution, and they bring the uh, process of antibiotic resistance and say, see, that's evolution that happens there. Bacteria change because you subject them to antibiotics. They develop resistance, and that's it. That's evolution. Remember this thing. We're going to get back to it on Monday night. Okay? Not going to answer it tonight. But remember this tension. The tension is there. It's real. How are we going to solve this? Well, some people solve it this way. It's just leave the church. Some, because some of the pastors don't preach enough about this. For example, only 35% of Protestant pastors teach on a specific topic of creation evolution more than once a year. The rest, 65%, one or less than that. That is at all. 35% of Protestant pastors address the topic seldom or never. They never talk about this. It's complicated. How are you going to talk about it? You don't know. You got to know a lot of stuff. Then only 1% of youth pastors address any topic related to science in the past year. And that was in 2011 from a study um, published in the article are the young people leaving their faith because of science by John G. West from the Discovery Institute. So there's, so there's not enough leaders to talk about these topics. And people's questions are not answered. And then, what do they do? The youth are leaving the church. 32% of Americans and unaffiliated with any religion believe that modern science proves religion is a superstition. And the percent, percentage goes up among the Protestants, mainline Protestants, to 39%. And 59 to 70 of young people who regularly attend churches within 10 years will drop out of organized religion. Some of them will come back. But you see how much this has to deal with, with the topic of science and religion. And then you have Richard Dawkins bringing this into the discussion. Come on, Dawkins. There you go. When he brings this up, you have even more people leaving the church. He says it is absolutely safe to say that if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane. Or wicked, but I'd rather not consider that. So, when you're faced with this, the church needs to be able to answer these questions. Um... Ask your children, ask your teenager, ask your, your young people how many times they have to deal with these issues in school. When we teach them one thing in the church and maybe they see something else at school, who do you think they're going to believe? Well, 35% of them 
believe what the church teaches about science is a myth. It's disconnected from reality. So maybe this makes us understand <clears throat> that there's something we should be doing about this. This, may, maybe make, this makes us understand that we need to somehow relate to evolution. Recently, I had a discussion with uh, some people online um, where they were complaining that it, one of our teachers in one of the schools in the United States was involved in the top topic of studying dinosaurs. Okay. And the complaint was, what do dinosaurs have to do with faith? We should be teaching something else. And then I got in, I cannot, uh, I cannot keep my mouth shut when this topic appears because it's, it's what I do. So I asked, do you think that we should not be teaching about evolution in our schools? Oh. It exploded. The forum exploded. What are you talking about? We should not be. We should be teaching the truth. Remember, I said teaching about evolution. Okay? If we don't teach our young people what science believes, if we present to them a mock theory of what science believes, and I say, oh, we have all the answers. That, that's not true. Those scientists, they don't know anything. If we do that, then they go to school and they learn the, the, what science really says. Who do you think they're going to believe? Their scientist professors or us who just present them a straw man of evolution. Oh, do you think you came from monkeys? We didn't come from monkeys. That, is, that statement there is so wrong. I'm going to unpack it, but we should never say that. Nobody says that. The theory of evolution does not say that. So we need to know. Now, here we come to the last part of this presentation. And I want to take you back 26,000 years. No, I'm sorry, 2,600. Yeah, that's a thing. And no normal language on earth uses uh, hundreds to count. It's only English. English uses hundreds. A normal language would say 2,600 years because that's how people count. But in English, English is a very special language. If you want to learn English, you have to learn how to read English, and then you have to learn how to speak English, and then how to learn how to write English because that's completely different. For those of you who are native of English, you don't know what it means. It's very complicated to learn how to speak and write English. Normal languages, you write as you read. English, very special case. But we love it because it's English, so what can you do? Okay, so going back to our topic, 2,600 years ago in Babylon, we have the stories of three young, actually four, young Hebrew men who were brought from their captivity, from their country, into the Babylonian captivity. And you know the story, the story of Daniel and his friends. First chapter of Daniel, they don't want to eat the, the, uh, the meat that the, the emperor, the king has given them. They said, okay, let us eat uh, vegetables, more, more likely lentils and other things, um, but with vegetables, of course. And of course, the vegetarians among us will be, yeah, they were vegetarians. They were not, because they had to eat uh, lamb. Because if you are a Jew and you don't eat a lamb, that's a big problem. You have Passover. So they were not vegetarians. It just was easier for them to stay away from the unclean meat and the meat that was uh, offered to gods that way. <clears throat> but very interestingly, after 10 days, um, their supervisor found them looking more healthy. I said, okay, I'll leave you with that. But after their year of training, the Bible says something very, very interesting. And I wanted you to read with me. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And then it says that in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. Now, whenever we read this, like, oh, okay, these guys just studied their math and whatever, and it was really easy for them. But are we really aware of what they were studying? For a young Jew, what they were studying was nothing short of blasphemy. It says there all kinds of literature and learning. Do we know how the literatures of the Babylonians look like? That's not Genesis 1 and 2. I'm going to give you an example. 
But we, I want us to, to put us into their mindset. So there were Jews. And from the, from the book of Daniel, we understand they were very faithful Jews. Is that correct? Were they faithful? In everything. In the book of Daniel, they were faithful. Okay? They didn't want to eat pork. And were all the other unclean meats and, and the wine and everything. They didn't want to do that. So they were very faithful. However, they understood something very, very interesting. That you need to know the errors of others if you are ever going to present your case to them. That you need to be better than them at understanding their own system if you are ever going to have a chance of presenting your case to them. That you need to understand how they think and what they know in order to be able to gain the philosophical problems that they have and present your case better. I'm going to give you an example, and you all know this, it's nothing new. You've probably heard of Enuma Elish, okay, which is literature of that part, Samaria, Babylonia, and that presents the, the myth of creation. Enuma Elish are the first two words, which mean, mean when above. That's how the, that, that thing starts. And this is what it reads. Now, Marduk, Marduk was not one of the main gods, but because Marduk was the god of, of, of Babylon, you know how it happens. It got, he got elevated to the, to the prime role. He was the, the hero of the gods. Let's see what Daniel and his friends were studying in Babylon. And let's see the things at which they were ten times better than the sorcerers. And this is just one of the things. <clears throat> the text reads, Marduk spread out his net to enfold her. That's Tiamat. There, there. It's another god. The evil wind which followed behind, he let loose in her face. When Tiamat opened her mouth to consume him, he drove in the evil wind that she closed not uh, her lips. Give me a second. This wind charged her belly, her body was distended, and her mouth was wide open. He released the arrow. It tore her belly. It cut through her inside, splitting her heart. Having thus subdued her, he extinguished her life. He cast down her carcass to stand upon it. The power, her power was broken, her army scattered. With his unsparing mace, he crushed her skull. He split her like a shellfish into two parts. Half her her he set up and sealed as the sky. Now here the tablet on which this is, is written is broken. And we don't know what he did with the other half. But we assume he made the earth with it. That's what they were learning in Babylon. This is their creation myth. One god kills another god, and with her body, he makes the sky and the earth. So unlike the Genesis narrative. However, Daniel and his friends learned this ten times better than all the sorcerers. They didn't say, oh, I'm not going to study that because that's, that's heresy, that's blasphemy, I am, a, I am a devout Jew. No, they didn't say that. Because they understood you have to know the other systems of interpretation if you are ever to present a solid case for yourself. Now, here comes the creation of mankind. Um, no, no, the other one. Come back, go back. Okay, when Marduk hears the word of the gods, his heart prompts him into to fashion artful works. Opening his mouth, he addresses Ea to impart the plan he had conceived in his heart. <coughs> Blood will I amass and cause bones to be. I will establish a savage. Man shall be his name. Verily, savage man will I create. He shall be charged with the service of the gods, that they may be at ease. This is how the Babylonians taught man was created. So unlike the biblical narrative. In the biblical narrative, and we'll talk a little bit about this, God creates everything through his word. Question. Could he have created humankind the same way? Could he have said, let there be mankind? What do you think? Could he? Of course, he's God. But mankind was so important to him that he just wanted, to, I'm going to do this myself. You know, like, like, an, like a chef who gives orders to his uh, kitchen. Okay, you cook that, you cook that. But the meal that he likes the most, like, get out of my way. I'm going to do this myself. That's how I see God. He says, okay, I'm going to do this myself. So he stoops down, takes earth, and he builds humanity with his own hands. Why? Because he wanted a relationship with humanity. Remember in chapter 3, 
God walks through the window of the garden and says, Hey, Adam, where are you? Where are you at? Come here. We've got to talk. God creates humankind for a relationship. In the Babylonian myths, the gods create human, humans because they just want to be at ease. They're too lazy. I don't want to do that work. Let's just put the humans to bring all the food and stuff because, ah, you know, you know how that works. Yeah, politically. So they put into the minds of people that they should be sacrificing to the gods. And well, well, all those sacrifices would go to the temple. So the, the priestly caste would retain power. So you can see how it, that is built. It's built because of political purposes. But the bibli biblical narrative is different. It presents a God who wants to enter in a relationship with you personally. And that's why he fashions humankind from, from the dust of the earth. Because he cares about us. And they had to study that. Not only that, but all kinds of sorceries. <clears throat> in Babylonia, one of the methods of divination, <clears throat> besides the astrology and stars, was the <coughs> divination in animals' entrails. Okay, So they would just cut a sheep, take all the intestines, splash them on the table. Mm, what does the future look like? Oh, yes, this liver shows that the, that's the deal. That's what they would learn. And Daniel and his friends learned that. Now, don't you think that we should know, even if you don't agree with evolution, it doesn't matter what, what you believe about evolution or not, if you believe in evolution or not. And we're going to talk about this throughout the week. But don't you think you should know what evolution says? Don't you think we should teach our children, okay, this is what science says about the world. And this is it. Okay? If you believe in it and, or not, that's a different thing. If I'm going to teach about evolution, I'm going to teach it rightly with the strengths of evolution and with the weaknesses of evolution. Nobody teaches about the weaknesses of evolution in school. They don't, they don't do that because they might think, oh, but people will not believe it. It doesn't matter. If it's true, it's true. You got to teach it with strengths and weaknesses. And I believe that our schools are best fit to do that. You see... Paul, writing to the Thessalonians, he told them, test all things and hold fast to what is good. There you go. Test all things. Know all things. When did ignorance ever do anyone any good? Oh, I don't want to know about evolution. Maybe I'll get led astray. Well, that's a different issue. But you got to know. You have to know what other people are thinking. Because we need to answer questions. We need to allow our young people to ask questions in the church. And it's okay to say, I don't know. Let's find the answer together. Instead of saying, oh, don't ask about those stupid things. Because they're not going to stop asking. They're just going to stop asking you. They're going to ask somebody else. Who maybe is not going to give them a balanced position. It, is, it depends on us. I know it's difficult. We have to do whatever is in our power to know more than what we know. If you are an, a, people who, a person who doesn't believe in evolution, when you engage in dialogue with somebody who believes in evolution, you have to be able to correctly represent his position. As I said, don't tell him that, oh, you evolutionists all believe that people evolved from monkeys, because that's not true. They don't believe that. The correct representation is that humans and apes, okay, not monkeys, apes, come from a common ancestor. That's what evolution teaches. It's not that people come from monkeys. Don't build straw men. Because then they'll say, you don't know anything about evolution. Why should I listen to you? Go read. And they're not going to listen because you are ignorant. We have to learn what evolution says. And if you believe in evolution and you believe God used evolution... <clears throat> don't believe, like Danny Lamoureau and others, that the B Bible teaches about the earth being, <clears throat> no, that the heavens is like an inverted metal bowl. That never, they never teach that. That's false. There's a very interesting article by Randall Yonker and Richard Davidson who show that this invention that most theistic evolutionists use to discard the creation story is fake. They didn't even believe that. It was invented in the 19th century by some German historians and theologians. So you got to know what your dialogue partner 
knows. Remember, I'm not saying your opponent. Because those that we engage with are not our opponent. They are our dialogue partners. Even if you believe something else than I believe, you're not my opponent. I might be able to learn something from you. Because when you engage in dialogue with people that you don't agree with, that's fine. They show you your blind spots. Everybody has blind spots. Everybody has philosophical assumptions that they make about the world. Some of them are true. Some of them might not be true. So when you engage in dialogue with people that you don't agree with, they show you your weaknesses. They show you your blind spots. Jesus said, talking to the disciples, Jesus told them, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Never be afraid of the truth. We should never be afraid of the truth. Now, we, we might not like the truth, and that's a different story, but we should never be afraid of the truth. Because in church, any, many times people present topics like this, they would ask the audience something along this line, trying to convince people to believe in God <clears throat> rather than in evolution. What would you prefer? That you live in a world, in a universe that has no purpose, that just appeared by itself? Or would you prefer to live in a world created by God that created you for a specific purpose? Now, of course, Christians would say, I want to live in the second world. But it doesn't matter what you want. It doesn't matter. It's inconsequential. What matters is what is true. Because if you want to live in a world created by God, but it turns out that the world was not created by God, to what purpose does it serve you? You're lying yourself. You're fooling yourself. And if you prefer to live in a world without a God, okay, that appeared by itself, to what purpose does it serve you if you, dis if you discover that the world was, was indeed created by God? Truth matters, my friends. That's why I entitled this presentation, Searching for the Truth About Origins. We need to find out the truth. And when, you, when you're in search for truth, you have to remember something. You have to start with the concept, the idea that you might be wrong. That's not easy to do. If you don't start with that and you say, I'm right in everything, he's wrong, I'm going to convince her that she's, she's wrong and I'm right, you're indoctrinating people. You're not engaging in dialogue. A dialogue is two ways. You have to acknowledge that sometimes you might get it wrong, and that's fine. Theologians that believe in creation, they did get it wrong. For example, they got it wrong when they thought about the um, fixity of species. See, they looked at Genesis, uh, which one is this? I think it's 120. I've got to put the... So they said, no, go back, go back. Ah. There you go. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creatures according to its kind. Cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth, are each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, uh, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. Because of that, until the 18th century, people believed, well, everything that we see today was created by God exactly as it is today. A polar bear, for example. Yeah, so that's what's created like that. Well, that's not true. Because we know today that organisms change. We know that they suffer modifications. And God did not, if He created, which I believe, but if He created, He could have just created one, okay, for lack of a better word, kind. We're not going to use the modern taxonomy because that's not represented in the Bible. But an animal with the potential to change in a way, to adapt to, their, to its environment. That's what change is there for, to adapt. Because environments changes, environments change, and if the animals are not able to adapt, then they perish. So the Bible never teaches and never taught the fixity of species. That was just something that we thought it taught. But by engaging with people that we don't believe, that believe something else, we discovered, oh wait, we were wrong about that. So let's see how we can adapt our worldview to include that. So whenever we engage in dialogue, it is important to acknowledge the fact that we might be wrong. We have no allegiance to our opinions. 
We only have allegiance to truth. You see, the Bible says that the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. What does that mean? Fear of the Lord, it doesn't mean to be afraid of God. It means to just acknowledge that some, there's somebody who's greater than you, who, who <clears throat> rules everything. In our context, it means to understand that knowledge, complete knowledge, is something that it will always escape me, us. There's always going to be something more to learn. You're never going to know everything. The more you learn, the more you realize how much you don't know. Only ignorant know, think they know everything. The more you study, the more you realize, oh, wait, I got to know that and that and that. There's so much to learn. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> we have to acknowledge. We have to have this new attitude towards truth. Truth matters. Let's search for the truth. It might not be the truth that I like, but I have to search for the truth. Anything else but the truth doesn't serve me. And we have to respect the, our dialogue partners. You see, many times in churches, evolutionists are portrayed as nothing less than devil worshipers. Like, oh, these evolutionists, they try to destroy our faith. Well, the reality is, that most evolutionists are normal people who just don't believe in God and they, want, they have their own explanation about life. And theistic evolutionists or evolutionary creationists, most of them are very devout Christians. I don't necessarily agree with them or them with me, but they're devout Christians who believe in the Jesus Christ, believe that he died for them and who love the Lord. So we need to learn to respect our dialogue partners. If we just say, oh, you're a heretic, I'm not going to talk to you, how are you going to win that person ever to your position if you don't respect their, their way of thinking? So, my dear family, church family, I like to ch call my church family because that's what church should be, a family where people should come in and feel like they're accepted and loved and helped to grow, not where they're judged by how they dress or speak or look like. So my dear church family, this is the challenge that we're facing. Science is very important to the majority of our young people. If we don't offer an, an informed answer, they might leave. And how are we going to ever get informed if we don't care about what science has to say? We need to learn about evolution. You don't have to believe in it. We have to know what it says because the truth will set us free. So I want to encourage you to come with me in this journey, a seven-day journey, when we will explore the truth about science. We'll search for the truth about science. So that's what we did today. We, we set up the, 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 the foundation. On Monday night, <clears throat> that's gonna, it's entitled Not Scientific, but what if it's true? We're going to talk about the uh, philosophical assumptions that people make when they do science. And how the science of origins is a little bit different. Remember that question when I said that, why do we accept the findings of, of, of science, but some, the Adventist church doesn't necessarily accept the findings of, of uh, science of evolution? Well, Monday night, we're going to answer that question. And we're going to see why that is the case. So, come. If you really, really, really can come, okay, watch it online. But come here. Then on, uh, on uh, Tuesday, we're going to talk about what the Bible says about origins. Because some people think that the Bible says something, but they might not say that. So we're going to look at what the Bible says and what the Bible doesn't say about origins. And we're going to see how the biblical text is put together in a very intentional way so that it teaches us something. Then we're going to talk about the origin of life, because that is important. Um, some people say, well, abiogen abiogenesis is not evolution. Well, that's true. The theory of evolution works without having a theory of abio abiogenesis, but that's not the point. If you want to have a complete theory of origins, you have to include the origins of life. So we're going to talk about that, how life appeared, what science says about that, what can we know, what can we not know about it. Then we're going to move to the theory of evolution and how 
the process of evolution is supposed to be work, to be working, and that we're go is going to be on Thursday, the complexity of life. On Friday, we're going to talk about something a bit hard for Christians. We are going to talk about the questions for which we don't have answers. You see, it's hard to live without all the answers. But we need to know, nobody has all the answers. <clears throat> and we need to learn to live without having all the answers. And on Friday night, we're going to talk about the issues of the, is of the science of origins where our church doesn't really have all the answers and not the best answers, and we still need to be looking for those answers. We're going to talk about the testimony of the past. We're going to talk about geology, paleontology, and stuff like that. And then we're going to end next Sabbath with um, when I'm going to introduce the model that I suggest to you that I believe respects the Bible and science in a better degree than the model that I have talked about uh, today. And we're going to talk about how to deal with, again, people that we don't agree with and how we can include the teaching of evolution in our schools and in, in, in creating people better prepared to reach others for the glory of God. Until then, remember, truth sets us free. Never settles, never settle for anything less but the truth, even if it hurts, even if you don't like it, especially if you don't like it. Because if you believe a lie <clears throat> and you like your lie, you're going to die. I just meant poetry. I didn't know that. Okay. The thing is, if we are in a lie, and we don't want to get out of it because we like it so much. That's going to bring us our death. So never settle for anything less than the truth. Amen.